Is the voice okay? Right. Welcome everyone to the afternoon session entitled Mosque Architecture Between Global and the Local. Uh, my name is Dr. Sheikh Anubaraki. I'm the Chair of the Architecture Department at the College of Architecture at Kuwait University. Uh, we welcome you all. Uh, we have a fantastic uh, layout of uh, 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 papers uh, this afternoon. Uh, some of them uh, we heard are going to be online, so four of the sessions uh, will be online. Uh, and we have a slight shift uh, with Dr. Mona, uh, who will be presenting first, and Dr. Mohammed, who will be uh, presenting tomorrow, inshallah. Uh, so I'll go ahead and present uh, our first speaker. So Dr. Mona Helmi uh, is going to present to us today an article entitled Mosque Architecture in Contemporary Popular Culture, a Critical Perspective. Dr. Mona uh, is an architect, urbanist, and educator. Currently, she's an associate professor of architecture and urban design at the British University in Egypt. She received a doctoral degree in architecture and city planning from Stuttgart University. She holds a master's degree in urban design and a bachelor of architecture from Ain Shams University, Egypt. Between 2010 and 2018, Dr. Helmi was the founding chair of the architecture department at Dar al Hikma University in Jeddah. Welcome, Dr. Helmi. Thank you. Um, Okay, I'll, I'll maybe try to start without mic. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah. Okay, so good afternoon everyone uh, and thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to present my research to you. Actually today I'm going to talk about uh, a topic that was of big interest to me. Uh, about popular architecture mosques. Why we find sometimes some mosques and we don't um, absorb it, or we don't perceive it well, although some other communities are rating it as the best building, for example, or the best mosque, or the best destination in this country. Uh, it was of big interest to me, I started to think about, and I tried to link it to the culture, or to the overall taste of people, and usually taste of people is uh, combined from this different aspects, might be uh, the degree of education, might be the economic level. So let's just dive through, and uh, I'm trying to explore in my presentation a uh, different orientation about popular architecture mosques. Let's go uh, generic at the beginning, and I want to go in a very generic way about popular and what popular culture is. Popular culture is a multifaceted term. Also, we can find it sometimes in some of the references as informal culture. This means that we have formal culture. We'll talk about it later on. Uh, sometimes we can find it as low culture. I'm not trying to give it a negative impression, but these are the terms that are connected with the popular culture in many of the references. Popular culture is a set of practices, beliefs, and objects that embody the most broadly shared meanings of a social system and usually associated with either mass culture or folk culture. This means that lots of people like it, love it, and favor it. So I'm just gonna continue somehow generic, and because I'm talking generic, I'm gonna refer the culture uh, to many aspects, uh, such as um, painting, music, uh, to reach the most at the end. So this is still my presentation, don't be bored. So uh, this is formal versus informal. Uh, remember that I said that informal is sometimes a synonym of the popular culture. So informal. Formal is official, following, or done according to established form, rule, maybe principles, whatever. It's a well-established thing that we used to see. How about informal? Informal is the absence of formality. 
and it's following or appropriate to ordinary, casual, or familiar use. Actually, it reminds me with the classical language and the slang. So I can refer it also in terms of linguistics to a classic, which is Fusha, and al Ammiya, which is the slang, or the dialect. Um, going to music, we can refer the former to the elite or the intelligentsia um, taste, which is uh, defined as the elite culture is a term that particularly reference the tastes of the established aristocracy. How about popular taste? Popular taste is, again, remi remember I said that it's linked with the mass appeal. Many people would like it, although it is not very formal, it is not classical, and there is another degree which we call it populist. And I'm not referring to populist in a political aspect, but populist culture, which is simply uh, promotes simplistic solutions that are usually uh, vulgarity, fake, or false to serious and complex <coughs> problems. So after this generic introduction, um, and including also fashion from the formal dress to the popular to the populist dress that we can see here. And here the definition is linking more uh, the high culture and the low culture to the economic or the socioeconomic and educational level, which is in a way or another linking the overall or shapes the overall taste of people. So leaving all of this and going to the mosques, and uh, we're talking about the popular architecture of uh, mosques. So uh, high culture or formal mosques are usually following what's so called um, formal architectural aesthetics, which are shaped by specific sets of well-established design principles, elements, trends, style, tastes, and so on. Here what we see is Sultan Hassan complex. Uh, of course, it's a mosque and madrasa. Uh, and it is in Cairo, Egypt. We can notice the lovely proportions of the dome and how it is uh, very much integrated with the overall components of the building. And it goes in a very much in harmony. While in popular mosques, um, or the popular architecture of mosques, uh, is a form of manipulated artistic taste reflecting common cultural signs, signal symbols. This mosque that we see, the Bong Mosque uh, in Pakistan, uh, won the Aga Khan Award. Again, I don't want to give the negative sense that popular architecture is not good. This mosque uh, won the Aga Khan Award and with all of its component colors, ornaments and whatever you can see in this image that reflects part of the mosque. Uh, the report of the uh, Aga Khan technical review about uh, this mosque and the jury commented on it that this is the best mosque reflecting the culture of Pakistan. And they said that it's an adding value to the Pakistani culture. They said also that this mosque with all of its vigor, sentiment, tension, use and misuse of sign and symbols, it represents the culture of the country. So let's go through what are the necessary or the basic elements or the essential elements of any mosque. Uh, actually, what we see here is an installation. But anyways, because I found it transparent, I wanted to have this image, um, uh, the four main elements we have here is Beit al-Salah in any mosque, you, need, you have to find it. Beit al-Salah, which is a physical place for praying al sahm or the mosque court, usually a roof place for several activities of prayers, and the Qibla, and usually the Qibla wall is facing Mecca, and the mihrab, which is a niche uh, 
uh, you can find in the Qibla wall and usually used by the Imam or uh, the leader uh, uh, who is leading the play itself. So this means that the dome and minaret um, are not treated like top things that you have to find it in any mosque. But we used to uh, view it in any mosque and it started to be something like a sign or an indication that this is a mosque and this was a topic that was uh, uh, discussed in the previous session uh, uh, by many scholars. So, um, recently, uh, there are many emergent architectural languages, experimentations, uh, which has resulted in new mosques, expressions, aesthetics. Here, for example, going to this mosque, and it's called the Pink Mosque as one of its names in Philippines, um, culturally, it's very favored because the pink color um, in Philippines is a sign of love, unity, and peace, and that's why they wanted very much to have their mosque in, in pink. Maybe in other culture, this would um, transmit the sense of rom romantic or so, but again, we need to link any mosque to its culture and to its context. Uh, the other mosque called Safina al Najah in Indonesia, and we can see a very literal Safina or whatever boat, and it was inspired from the story of Prophet Nuh alayhi salam. When he uh, left his land in a boat, and maybe you know the entire history, and it's about Safina al Najah, life boat, and you have a simple, just to give it the sense of being a mosque, to have this imposed greenish dome on top of it. Uh, another mosque called Masjid 99 Qubba, and Qubba is a dome, and this is, the masjid is named after the number of domes it has, and these domes are um, uh, 99 because it's following uh, the uh, number of the good names of Allah, 99 in Quran and Hadith. And, and it's in Indonesia, uh, regardless if you like it or not, it's one of the most favored and people would find inside the reverence and uh, uh, all of the good feelings that they need to have inside a mosque. So it means that we are talking about a dilemma, who is seeing what in a good and who else is seeing it as maybe weird or not comfortable. Um, another mosque, believe it or not, it's a mosque. And it's in Poland. And this mosque, uh, as per the description of the architect, uh, it wasn't, by the way, a uh, church and then it was done as a mosque, but it was designed to be a mosque from the beginning. Of course, the green color refers to the um, color of the dome of uh, uh, Prophet Mosque, uh, and that's why they, they wanted to have it in green. And it's following its design, uh, design of a church, because this is the context, and that's why they said that it should be integrated with the context, and that's why it should be similar to other worship uh, buildings they have in Poland. Um, same story and manipulating uh, of religious uh, uh, buildings, and uh, maybe if I wouldn't tell you that this is a mosque, you wouldn't know. And this is a mosque in Beijing, and it looks like very much um, a temple, uh, the typical traditional architecture uh, in, uh, so it's a matter of the relevancy of popularity. It's popular to whom and where. So um, again, in, in my research, I try to uh, dig deeper and to criticize and to classify different orientation and different uh, maybe uh, approaches on um, the mosques and, and to having popular mosques in their context. So some of the mosques are following uh, a folkloric approach, so they are 
reflecting the art and craft of the community they are in. We can see to the uh, left the Nokian uh, mosque in Nova, Upper Egypt. Again, of course, we can identify that this is a mosque because we have the dome and we have the minaret, but just see it within the context and, and buildings that are crafted and painted by people themselves. So this is uh, a mosque that represents the culture and the art of the community itself. Uh, to the right here is Tuban Grand Mosque in Indonesia, um, and it was um, done in a way to reflect the art of the community. Again, we can see the patterns, the colors, and the way of mixing many colors. You cannot really identify, and by the way, this is what was written about it. This is not my own critique, but they said that um, people would be confused if it is something like a Disney, the Sleeping Beauty Castle in, in Disney, because of the lovely colors it has, and the minaret that sometimes follows some of the Russian uh, 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 churches. So again, the the art and craft and the, the overall taste of a community, it, it is reflected on, uh, in their mosques. Um, Wazir Khan Mosque in Lahore, Pakistan, this is the mosque, and when I saw it, personally, it reminded me very much with the uh, track art that they have, and very famous for the Pakistani. Uh, you can see, you can relate, you know, the uh, rhythmic, the repetition, uh, the ways that they are very clever in. I'm not sure if you saw it or not, but when I saw this, I felt that it's part of the art and craft being done traditionally in Pakistan. Another trend is being eclectic, and I'm going to talk about eclectic architecture of mosques. And usually, it's a collage of imported or borrowed cultures. Uh, in general, ec eclecticism re uh, refers to any design that incorporates elements of traditional motifs and styles, decorative aesthetics, ornament, structural features that are mainly originated from other culture or from other architectural periods or even context. Um, here I have. Uh, a photo of Al Ruiz Mosque in Jeddah, and it's designed by Abdul Wahid Al Wakil. So let me see <coughs> that this is a mosque, and this is the new Al Gurna village by Hassan Fakhi, which was built before this mosque, and we can relate the same vocabulary of architecture. Uh, the design of Al Ruiz Mosque manifests a unique combination of perfectly integrated historical architectural vocabularies that was used in previous projects. Actually, one of the scholars, Al-Assad, in 1992, he said that every one of Al-Wakil's design includes direct and <coughs> literal quotations from monuments belonging to enormous uh, era of Islamic architecture. Other scholars uh, saw uh, the works of Al-Wakil as the leaders of other architecture in an eclectic way. Five minutes? Two minutes. So populist architecture, and we spoke about it before, we said that populist is about promoting primitive or fake or shallow signs and symbols to produce a glorification of vulgarity and the mockery of serious solution. Here we have, of course, the Prophet Mosque in Medina with its very well-known uh, green dome, and this green dome was treated in a very primitive, shallow, fake way, just to give a sign or a symbol that this is a holy place, of course, regardless of the proportions or where to put it, or, uh, you know, the, the original uh, uh, function of it. So we go quickly. Other uh, approach is mimic mosques or mimicked architecture when you are copying simply from a valued or a, for a, a, a famous building. Here we have a mosque, Fatma al-Zahra Mosque in Kuwait, and here we have Taj Mahal, and we can relate very much uh, to both of them. Uh, Kitsch architecture is another direction. 
And uh, the kitsch is a design in a poor taste with an excessive uh, gushiness, but appreciated in an ironic or knowing way. Actually, this is Al Sahaba Mosque in Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt, and it's one of the landmarks. And if you type on, on Google where to go or to, where to visit in Sharm el Sheikh, this will appear the first thing, although it has a very scripted proportions and it was somehow um, inspiring uh, its architecture from uh, other buildings. But this is very different uh, because sometimes the term kitsch is often mixed up with hybrid or eclectic uh, because kitsch simply is falsified history, freely mixing different styles and histories, also changing in the proportions and doing many things, and very often produces a styleless building decorated with pitiful imitation uh, of what used to be good architectural solutions. Um, again, I'm trying to keep my time. Uh, another um, popular architecture, most, which is the vernacular architecture, and uh, it's, uh, sometimes it reminds us with a spontaneous or the slang expression uh, of popular taste. And usually, uh, of course, it's not only environmentally friendly. That, for example, here in this Lartanga mosque in Ghana, uh, it's being built uh, with the local system of building using local materials. And when uh, the minaret, this one, was collapsed, uh, people from uh, the city, uh, they uh, built it or rebuilt it, uh, renovated because this is a traditional way of building the uh, The research ends up with some orientations for direction uh, that we saw some of them, like for example the folkloric architecture, hybrid, eclectic, teach, mimic, and so on. And although uh, we spoke about that every mosque might fit the culture of its context. Uh, the popular taste of most architecture expresses growing dilemmas to current expressions of most architecture, while they seem to have appeal to many people, they may embody a superficial and exaggerated discourses to others. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Muna, uh, with these astounding images of uh, popular mosque, mosque culture. Next will be uh, Dr. Haris, who's joining us online. Um, and I think the remainder of our, our uh, speakers will be online as well. So I'll just introduce Dr. Haris. He will be presenting a paper entitled Images, uh, Imagining a Regional Identity, Contemporary Kashmiri Mosque as a Study. Dr. Haris is an assistant professor of Islamic art history at the University of Sarajevo. His research focuses on Islamic art in Bosnia and Herzegovina. He has participated in both national and international projects and is currently involved in a project entitled Under the Sky of Cheerful Faith, Islam and Europe in Bosnian Experience and also Islam, Architecture, and or Orientalizing <coughs> Style in Habsburg, Bosnia. His work has been published in scientific and popular journals, weekly and online magazines. Uh, he's the co-editor of the Proceeding of the International Symposium Islamic Art, and the co-author of the book entitled 40 Bosnian and Herzegovinian uh, Mushafs. Doctor, uh, can you hear us? Uh, yes. Wonderful. So you have 10 minutes to present. Whenever you're ready, uh, we can see you on the screen. Okay. Thank you. 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 Just a second. Okay. Uh, and, no. oh, yes. Fantastic. Here. Uh, now, 
The paper of my research is Ottoman masks in Bosnia and Herzegovina between center and periphery. Uh, center and periphery theory is not new in art history, as you all know. It questions the relationship between the center of art production and its periphery. Whatever part is chosen, geographical, economic, social, it helps to deconstruct the prevailing approach to which only works created in the center are significant. Uh, if we apply the center periphery theory to the most, to most popular surveys of Ottoman architecture by Gottfried Godwin and the other by Doan Kuban, the emphasis on Istanbul is clear. We must not forget that Kuban in his book Osmani Barisi titled one chapter Architecture in the Provinces. In the introduction of this chapter, Kuban, Kuban summarizes perhaps the fundamental problem of the center periphery model by stating it was in the capital that the history of Ottoman architecture was written. This quote is evidence of Eastern centrism in Ottoman studies, in this case, architecture. Uh, where well, works created on the edge of the empire, in our case, in my case, Bosnia, are observed only from the perspective of the capital. Here are the two books dedicated to the Ottoman architecture developments. Ekrem Haki Ayverdi is the Turkish author and the professor and author of the sixth volume study of Europa, that was Mani Memare as a Levy, in which he reviewed Ottoman architectural heritage in the Balkans. Makiel Kiel did a notable influence in the field, where the collection of essays titled <coughs> Studies on the Ottoman Architecture of the Balkans should be singled out. According to Makiel Kiel, 20,000 Ottoman monuments were built in the Balkans. After implementing the center periphery theory to the Ottoman architectural heritage in Bosnia, I recognized four groups of Ottoman masks in Bosnia. Masks on the center, edge masks, borderline masks, and regional masks. New aesthetic ideas originate almost each time in the center of artistic production, which became a canon in a certain period and for a particular region. During the Ottoman period, it was Eastern, it was Constantinople. In the Balkan provinces of the Ottoman Empire, there were no buildings such as Istanbul's Blue Mask or, as for case, Topkapi Palace. But architectural solutions that keep pace with aesthetics of the center are still recognizable. It means that in Bosnia could be found masks that do not diminish behind ones in Istanbul. And if we have the chance, cut and pass to the capital of these masks, they would not differ from there that in Istanbul. Compared to the other Balkan cities where the Ottomans left their mark, Sarajevo stands out as the most representative example of Ottoman architecture and urbanism. Therefore, it is not surprising that in Sarajevo is found Gazhusra Bay mask, which contains all the components of large-scale complex. It was built in 1531 by Ghazi Husabe, the grandson of Sultan Bayezid II. This monumental complex contains all the elements of Ottoman Kuliya, or complex, and next to the mast is Imara, Madrasa, Hanika, Tutorbes, Hamam, and Arastavi Taiwan Sarf. The architect who designed the mask was no one else than Chief Sultan's architect, Alaudin, also known as Ajahn Esir Ali, who also designed Sultan Yavu Selim Mask, the palace of Bagali Ibrahim Pasha and Chobar Mustafa Pasha Mask in Islam. The bridge of Grand Vizir Sokolo Mehmed Pasha in Michigan is not only building designed by the famous Mimar Sinan in Bosnia. This maestro of Ottoman architecture did the project of Karajos Bay Mask in Bosnia. Ottoman sources also reveal 
the names of dozens of other architects who worked during the time of Mimar Sina and testified their remarkable talents. Like, for example, Mimar Khaihat, that came to Sarajevo in 1559 to oversee the construction of Ali Pasha Mas. He came to Sarajevo to be convinced that mosque in the Empire's West was built according to the aesthetics of the center. In the humanities, the term provincial is legacy of the colonial narrative and has a hint of the primitive, the backward, and the less valuable. To avoid misinterpretation of the architectural heritage that originated far from the capital, I will inaugurate the term edge must because these must developed on the very edge of the Ottoman cultural influence. A large number of non must in Bosnia had an almost standardized form. For example, on this photo, a dome above the square prayer space, porch with three smaller domes, and a stone minaret leaning against the rich right side of the mask cube. Compared to the mask of the center, these edge masks had a more rustic, rustic shape and less proportion. Some examples of the edge masks are Logamina, Sutan Selima mask in Krejina, Lala Pashina in Nirno, and etc. At first glance, we can see that these masks do not have the grace of the capital, which they still strive. Their minarets are often low and without mukarnas. It could be said that the edge masks cannot meet the high standards of the capital's architecture, but they are no less Ottoman <coughs> compared to the mask of Istanbul. And the third type of these masks are borderline masks. Bosnia, the westernmost province of the Ottoman Empire, was placed on the border between the Orient and the Occident. Most often, Bosnia's position is viewed as the political one, while it is forgotten that it was on the border of two different cultural phenomena. Bosnia was a part of the Orient, but also connected to the Occident. In Bosnia, these two contrasting aesthetic complement each other. It means that Ottoman era must have been influenced outside the main cultural cycle. Deviations from the Islamic Ottoman aesthetic are clear. The influence of European styles is easy to see. We find an example of this artistic practice in the mask of Hesuk Agar in Mostar, where the influence of the Dalmatian Renaissance is visible. Some architectural elements and decorations are not Ottoman. The capitals, consoles, window frames, portal, and the minbar are examples of late Gothic and early Renaissance. Flirting with different architectural patterns is best seen in the masks of South Eastern Herzegovina, which Professor Makiel Kiel sees as a blend of Islamic and Christian elements in the architecture of outlying border area of Balkans or Bosnia. This group includes Sefer Aga mask, Adish mask, the mask of Asa Pasha, and they are characterized by a square prayer space, a four pitch roof, and the most important, square based minaret. These square stone minarets are the most impressive feature of the mentioned masks. These buildings are a combination of Ottoman architecture and the architecture of Indonesia, which cause the unique symbiosis of the border of the Islamic world. Masks with the square minarets are certainly not the only monuments worthy of attention with the noticeable direct influence of European styles. The last type of the masks we found in Bosnia are regional masks. It is indisputable that in Bosnia, as a province of the Ottoman Empire, follow the instructions for the construction of the masks. It is also it also could not be neglected that new solutions were found which have enriched the Ottoman architectural tradition. The masks with wooden minarets were built in the local architectural language. 
compared to the mosque inspired by the aesthetics of the center, the regional mosques, sorry, the regional mosques were created thanks to local masters who, relying heavily on the tradition of folk architecture and natural conditions of the place and region, cre created indigenous forms of mosques with wooden minarets. If we go to data from 1933, it illustrates the prevalence of masks with wooden minarets. They accounted for 70% of the total number of masks built in Bosnia and Herzegovina. At the end, as a conclusion, Bosnian masks were not entirely influenced, as we saw, by Ottoman art and architecture, but also by local tradition and Western art. This research seems to provide an answer to the right approach, not only with the center periphery model, but also to bring answer for contemporary masks or masks in the future. Thank you very much. present with us today. Uh, however, they, their articles are available in the booklet. You're welcome to read. That gives us just about 10 minutes for Q&A. Uh, so I'd like to open it for Q&A. Uh, we have Dr. Muna uh, with us and Dr. Ruiz uh, on the way. So any questions? Um, my question is to, to Dr. Muna. I think mine. Okay. Just, Yes, mine. Does it work? Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. Muna and uh, uh, Dr. Harris for the two presentations. But my question goes actually to Dr. Muna. Uh, Dr. Muna, you talked about popular ar um, mosque architecture and you define the popular in, uh, against or in contrast to the formal. But most of the examples you brought are popular because they are, uh, for us as outsiders, non conventional. But some of the examples you brought are actually formal for their culture, like uh, the Waziri um, mosque in, in India. Mosques that you brought, maybe I can consider as, as popular, is the one in Egypt, the Nubian one, because it is done by the people. It is vernacular. And then you listed kind of a list of um, uh, attempts or um, directions, <coughs> and you, you, you listed them under, uh, under popular architecture one of which is uh, eclecticism, and you brought an example from Abdul Wahid al-Wakil. Abdul Wahid al-Wakil is most in Jeddah, all mosques in Jeddah are formal, because they are done by the state. And the state chose Abdul Wahid al-Wakil to transfer that type of architecture to Jeddah. So it is formal, it is not popular, it was not by the choice of the people themselves. So I wonder, Yani, I have kind of a doubt uh, regarding your definition of the popular and selection of the examples that you brought, plus all these list of, of uh, um, movements that, that you put under, like the, the one that you brought, uh, the kitchen. And the, yani, I, I can't fit those under populism, uh, so because maybe, maybe it is more it like, yeah, yeah. populism for me, uh, or, or popular architecture as, as we know it, is the vernacular, the one done uh, by the people for the people. But the examples you brought from Indonesia, especially the ones from Europe, are done by the people because, because uh, in Europe it's al Jali al Islamiyah, the one who, who decides on, uh, on their, their mosques. But in our countries, it is the state who chose the style for the, the mosques that goes formal, in my, in my opinion, not popular. Yeah, I'm a kind of disagreeing with you, and let us just start by. Um, clarifying what, what do we mean in the context of this research by popular. And I brought many definitions, uh, the majority of the definitions, although some definitions went more with the socioeconomic class, some other definitions went, went with the level of education of uh, the community. Uh, most of them, they agreed on uh, popular means that it's the mass appeal. When we clarify what, what a mass appeal is, it means that it's favored by the majority of the people living there. So I don't want to link it that this is official mosques done by the government or mosques done by the community. 
and I cannot limit the popular books just to be vernacular because there are other experimentations and other directions we've seen, not necessarily done or um, commissioned by the government, but um, these mosques were designed based on the favorite taste of the community. I agree with you that Wazir Khan Mosque, for example, is considered an official mosque in its context. But at the beginning, I said that it's a dilemma because when you see a mosque, maybe you cannot agree that this is your favorite mosque because this is not your culture, this is not your context. So it's it's a very dilemmatic <laughs> yeah, yeah, issue. And the definition for me was not clear. What is popular uh, most uh, uh, architecture? We can just cut it short by this is a mass appeal. But mass appeal, you know, a mass decides on whether they prefer or they like that, that architecture after the mosque is built. And mostly they like the mosques. So it is, they did not participate in the decision making of which style to choose. Yeah, I think uh, the community participation in choosing the design or deciding on the design uh, was discussed in other session, and uh, it might be not very much fitting into our topic. But I want to take it from, again, let's just take the, the example of Al Sahaba Mosque in Sharm el-Sheikh, if you still remember it, yeah. the very the fancy one. Yeah, uh, thing, and uh, it is not favored by a certain class of well-educated people who sees that it's a distortion of other buildings, although it's very favored by most of the people who go to Sharm el-Sheikh and just take a selfie with it. I mean, this is the dilemma here. This is what I, I wanted to, to clarify uh, throughout my presentation or maybe throughout the... So I, again, I'm not gonna link just uh, the term popular to vernacular architecture. It's unfair, actually, and I cannot link it uh, 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 between being, um, again, uh, Abdel Wahid al-Wakil mosques, because you, you raised this issue. Abdel Wahid al-Wakil mosques are very favored, and we like it very much. And some of it uh, uh, won the Adathan Award for yeah. architecture. So again, uh, as a term popular, I, I clarified many times that I don't mean that it's negative or it's low standard. But when I said that, sometimes you can find it in references as low culture or informal, this is what we find. But not necessarily this is uh, the result in all of uh, the mosques. Although I'm very much agreeing that um, some of the mosques that I presented today were, were really informal with the meaning of informal and it is not up to standard to be even called a mosque. Thank you. I hope I responded somehow. It's a dilemma. It's, yeah. a, it's the definition. It's a very debatable thing, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I, in fact, I don't have a question, but I want to say this topic is very important because it has a very range uh, in reality, but we don't uh, study it in our universities. Maybe my, I can say maybe the best uh, definition that. Uh, uh, the mosque that we study it, especially the academian architects and the critics and in books and in research, this is the, you can say, the uh, official ones and the, uh, otherwise they are popular. Mm -hmm. I, th I think so. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's really a good uh, uh, topic which needs more and more yeah, uh, of course. studying because of course. we, the architects, academian architects, we have as a limited top of view, uh, to, uh, view for the uh, subject, maybe the people, which they are majority, don't agree with us. Okay, thank you. And then have a very uh, another notes about the Sahaba Mosque, how it look from inside. Actually, I did not enter it. Uh, I wasn't inside, because it is a look very very high. It's inside it will be look like it's a, really. Very much stretch. <laughs> <laughs> there they have more than a uh, story? I have to look into this. Because it will be very, very strange and uh, <laughs> uncomfortable space. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Harris. Uh, I see our next uh, session uh, preparing.
uh, thank you all for coming. Um, if you're, you're welcome to see, there's another session happening right after this, and another one happening in this space. Hello, good evening. Um, my name is Dr. Hussain Dashti. Um, belong to Kuwait University. Um, Siti, are you are you on board with us? Can you hear me? Okay, okay, I can hear you. You can hear me, okay. So if you can just bear with us for one second, please um, stay on hold with us as we introduce the, the session. Um, okay. This is, this uh, is, uh -huh. yeah, just, just hold on. If you can just uh, mute okay. the mic for a second. Uh, this session is related to spiritual, spirituality and, and mosque architecture, and uh, it concentrates on the scientific aspect of uh, the building typology, the morphology of, of, of mosque based on the performative part. And by performative, I'm relating to um, things that are related to lighting and how light penetrates in the mosque, all the way to environmental issues like heat gain, heat loss. So we believe that there are some performative issues that we should look at when we um, talk about the, the topology of, of, and the forms of these uh, uh, spiritual entities. Um, without further ado, uh, we will have a total of four speakers here. I think one is uh, apologizing, hopefully we can catch up and join us later on. Um, the first speaker, uh, I'll read off here, my mobile is kind of tough to read. Uh, this is Siti Salwan, uh, Zuriani, BT, Dinan, and uh, Aliya Noor from Malaysia. Um, yes, yes, from Malaysia. Yes. And the title of her uh, paper here is going to be, um, uh, quote unquote, Evaluating Effectiveness of Malay Vernacular Most. Facade. So I repeat, Evaluating Effectiveness of Malay Vernacular Facade Design Concepts for Indoor Thermal Comfort in Malaysian National Masjid. So city the yes. floor is yours. Okay, can you check if you can do that? Okay. Okay, okay. Uh, now I can share. Okay, so so Assalamu alaikum and good day to everyone. I am Siti Sarwana, PhD student from International Islamic University. Uh, can, can you hear and see the screen right now? Yes, we can. You have a total of 10 minutes to speak. So please abide Okay. And, and as well, with the voiceover, can you hear the voiceover? Yeah. Yes, we can. Yes. Okay, I'm going to present the result of my research paper entitled The Indoor Thermal Comfort Analysis at Modern Vernacular Masjid in Malaysia. As you can see here, there are three main components in this research. Vernacular architecture act as the independent variable, while thermal comfort is the dependent variable. The purpose of highlighting on thermal comfort is because it is important for designer to consider the types, element of design on building facade, keeping in mind that the main source of heat is direct solar radiation. The focus is on vernacular architecture is because it is a style that is designed based on local need, availability of construction material, craftsmanship, technology, as well as reflecting the local tradition. Vernacular architecture is the independent variable, while the thermal comfort is the dependent variable in my research. Then, the masjid building acts as the mediator that relates between these two variables. 
It is because masjid is unique due to its unchanging and eternal primary function for Muslim communal worship, while architecturally has been constantly evolving since the earliest masjid were erected. The issue in this research is concerning the fact that there is no scientific data that support the theoretical reinterpretation of vernacular architecture in existing modern masjid for efficient thermal performance. It is unproven and lead to the research question on the relationship between vernacular architecture approach and indoor thermal performance in modern vernacular architecture in modern vernacular masjid. So the research objective is to evaluate indoor thermal performance to facade design being adapted by modern masjid. Fundamentally, this is an experimental research using two types of research method, namely the questionnaire survey and the field experiment. Stratified random sampling technique selected two modern vernacular masjid in Malaysia. The first building sample is the first modern vernacular masjid constructed after the independence of Malaysia, which is the Malaysia very own national masjid. It is located in Kuala Lumpur. And the second building sample is Raja Haji Fi Sabdillah Masjid, located at Cyberjaya, which has been awarded with platinum rating of Green Building Index for sustainable building. As I mentioned before, the dependent variable in this study is the modern vernacular architecture. Previous researchers already narrowed the typology of modern vernacular masjid in Malaysia into building forms and layout, orientation, height, openings and facade shading as well as construction technology. However, my presentation today will not speak in detail on those aspects. The timeline display in this slide reflect the population of 14 modern vernacular masjid in Malaysia which were constructed from 1965 to 2019. Through this quantitative experimental research, the dependent variable consists of three primary parameters to measure indoor thermal performance impacting from building facade of modern of modern vernacular masjid in hot and humid climate. Generally, Malaysia is a hot and humid clim uh, country located in the Southeast uh, Pacific. That's why the research is focusing on the hot, hot and humid climate. The first parameter is temperature. According to Malaysia standard of thermal comfort, the recommended indoor thermal to be is in the range of 23 to 26 degrees Celsius. Recommended relative humidity is within the range of 55 to 70 percent, while the air velocity is to be in the range of 0 0.15 to 0 0.5 meter per second. For research methodology, the purpose of conducting questionnaire survey is uh, to investigate on existing indoor thermal condition and the architectural element that contribute to thermal performance. It depends on user's response and the measurement is using five point Likert scale. The field measurement uh, is to collect data of dependent variable, namely the temperature, relative, humidity and air velocity using a specialized equipment and it is to relate the result from questionnaire with the on-site data finding. When respondent fill up section A, it is to build up the demographic profile. In section B, respondent were asked to read
to rate the perceived sensation on thermal comfort survey to assess current thermal condition in the masjid. Then in section C, it is to assess the architectural component that contribute to thermal performance according to the user's perception. For example, each building components is constructed with two different questions. And in two questions given for the aspect of building height, it inquire whether the respondents agree that the building sample manage to minimize the sun, the temperature for the prayer hall. And when the respondent were asked about the construction technology and at this masjid, most respondents thought that it is the lesser factor that contributed to the thermal comfort of the building. Same goes to the element of shading device. Less than 10% strongly agree that the shading device is capable of absorbing the heat and provide shelter to the user. At the same time, this survey found that users in both masjid mostly perceive masjid opening design as being the main contributor that efficiently allow the natural lighting and ventilation into the indoor prayer hall. So, the element of openings is perceived by the respondent as efficiently contributed to the effective thermal performance. <coughs> As comparison with result from site measurement, the indoor temperature values range from 23 to 27 degrees Celsius at Raja Haji Fi Sabilillah Masjid, while the measurement at Masjid at Malaysia National Masjid range lower, which is between 22 to 25 degrees Celsius. The lower or the lower reading of indoor temperature at Malaysia National Masjid might be from the higher wind velocity at the building, which is range from 0 0.75 to 1.55 meter per second compared to the air velocity at Raja Haji Fi Sabilillah Masjid, which is lower. Uh, it indicate the reading as 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 meter per second. Field measurement find that the relative humidity at both masjid are highest during the Fajr prayer time and the lowest humidity was recorded during the Zoho prayer time. So this justify the user's response in questionnaire survey which find that the air temperature is slightly below the thermal comfort level after the Zoho prayer time. In both masjid, the applied vernacular strategy at the building openings includes rambi, overhang, masharobia and minimal partitions which is to improve the thermal performance for masjid user. This space managed to reduce solar penetration and respondents feel the impact of indoor temperature decreasing at the main prayer hall. From the data collected, it can be concluded that users are satisfied with the masjid indoor thermal condition. It also complied with the requirement as mentioned by the Malaysian standard of thermal comfort. From this study, research gap include evaluation to extend and further test on the potential of building openings adapted from vernacular design approach into a modern masjid. The contribution in this research is to improve the well-being of people and value the natural environment.
Hopefully, the findings from this research can be expanded beyond the scope of masjid architecture and it can create a space for future research such as in another communal organization and residential development issues related to this area. As a conclusion, the application of vernacular approach in modern facade design show the originality and authenticity of a Malaysia identity for indigenous masjid architecture. The user perception and the satisfaction with the indoor thermal comfort responded to the element of vernacular architecture found in the facade of modern vernacular masjid. But the research might also compare, for example, the impact of Serabi, Masharobia, Patisha and any other building openings which significantly uh, give impact and manipulate the indoor thermal performance. Future research can also focus in finding uh, the suitable opening rate show at the semi-open space which allow natural lighting and ventilation for optimal indoor thermal performance. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so, any, any thank you very much. Questions? Yes, thank you very much. Um, your research kind of touches upon um, very similar uh, situations that we have in our part of the world, which is heat and uh, humidity. Uh, so we know, you know, the thermal comfort <laughs> issue. Uh, your research is also unique in terms of uh, trying to join the subjective issues next to the objective. So you can measure how people feel. Uh, uh, so we need that in research. I'll. Um, Open it up for any other questions from the audiences. Anybody? Yes, please. Uh, in the measurement, uh, I don't know what uh, season of the uh, year that you, you made the measurement. Okay. Uh, the measurement for Malaysia, we had the same uh, weather throughout the whole year, which is hot and humid. We don't have uh, winter, autumn, uh, or spring. The season is same throughout the whole year. So uh, basically, uh, the research reflects the condition in Malaysia at, uh, at all times. But, but I know it differs uh, because of the humidity. Humidity. The humidity changes throughout the year. Uh, it changes according to the rain, uh, the uh, raining season. Yes. So did you measure the difference? Okay. Uh, because uh, this, uh, this is just a, a small uh, part from my total uh, research area. So this is conducted on September, which is towards at the end of the year. So by this time, the uh, Malaysia <coughs> is going towards the 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 uh, season where there, there will be lots of rain. So um, in my research, there is a comparison between a uh, computer simulation and the field measurement. So computer simulation will uh, measure the same uh, the same uh, reading throughout the whole year, while the field uh, measurement in the uh, uh, reflect which month the survey is uh, taken on. So from the building simulation comparison with the field survey, the the difference, the regression between the reading is about 0.2%, meaning simulation from the whole year and the data taken in any month uh, of the year is not much different. Thank you. Thank you. Please. Any other question? Yes, we have another question here, please. Hello. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Very much of interest uh, for me as an architect. Uh, the question would be, um, so you mentioned uh, temperature, ventilation and humidity as three main parameters against which you uh, measure 
comfort of the uh, of the visitors. So, uh, uh, do I understand correctly that whereas you can uh, uh, through um, vernacular, let's say passive ways of cooling by shading, by yes. uh, whatever, reducing the uh, solar heat loads. Uh, ventilation is also doable, I mean through um, cross ventilation, through uh, uh, stack effect, whenever you have sort of a, uh, a play of height, you know, like, and then you can sort of uh, uh, make up this. And then uh, the humidity. Uh, there is effectively nothing that can be done with that, right? So meaning, of course, you've got certain uh, percentage, like 50 to 70 something, I think it was. Uh, but then, what effectively can be done? This is like uh, uh, my first part of the question, and the second would be if there are any impl implications which can be uh, extended beyond the mosque architecture, meaning the principles are more or less the same for uh, um, any uh, public or residential buildings, and because the physical effect is uh, identical, and uh, like how successfully those are being, I mean, uh, whatever you are studying or researching uh, would be implemented in a wider uh, uh, context. Thank you. Okay. Um, from from uh, from this research, uh, the the reading uh, the, there is a purpose of having three uh, main parameter: the temperature, air velocity, and uh, relative humidity. Basically, from uh, the aspect of relative humidity, we cannot do much. But um, we cannot do much because it is the environment, uh, the environment humidity. But we have to accept that what is the kind of effect that it will give to the to the building. So in case if the build, uh, the humidity humidity is um, beyond the the comfortable range, so the designer should. Uh, consider of selecting uh, material which will not interact or will not be affected with high hum too high humidity or too low humidity, such as if we use uh, steel. Uh, steel should not be applied at places with high humidity. Or let's say for timber, timber should not be uh, applied uh, at place with higher higher humidity because it will uh, give effect of fungus so it that is how we react to the to the readings of humidity and then for air velocity uh, the the effect of velocity gives to the building is because from the openings we we, we will understand that the openings will have certain certain percentage of opening ratio so from each partition the, the wind will be filtered and by the end to the prayer hall, uh, how much velocity is left that the user can feel. So this is how the designer should should adapt the, the potential of the site. In case if the, the site indicates there is a strong wind, so the designer can apply uh, the higher ratio of uh, the, the lower ratio of openings, meaning they can put more uh, more ornamentation. They can uh, the the designer can put more enclosed partition because the amount of air velocity coming through the the buildings is high. But then if the velocity is low, so the designer should should accept that they uh, the, the uh, he should. Uh, should open more. Uh, the design should be more open to to emit uh, the little amount of uh, air velocity coming through the building. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Siti. Thank um, I, I think you've used um, interesting uh, vernacular elements in in Malaysian culture, like uh, like in, in our part of the world, we use mashrabiya. I think it's quite uh, Arabic or, or uh, what about your part of the world? Do you you mentioned the uh, Salati or did I? Sarambi. Sarambi, Sarambi, yes. And yeah. and unfortunately, you don't show us these elements. You know, we architects like to visualize uh, stuff. So it would be, it would have been nice to show these elements and how you're dealing with this vernacular. Um, I'll, yes. I'll take another question if there is any. 
I really wish to show, but then the 10 minutes will not be enough. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Well, you're kind of lucky because our um, other presenters, um, at least as of now, they have not gone in um, in the Zoom program, so I, haven't, I don't see them. So we can take uh, a couple more questions as we speak um, here. I have a question. You know, I don't want to take any, any but is that chances to take questions? If you don't have any, I can ask a question. Um, what about checking air temperature in terms of height in a mosque? For example, if you take the temperature at a ground level, if you have a high dome in the center, the temperature, assumingly, will be higher at a, a higher altitude. Is this the same in, in your uh, environment? Okay. Uh, or in your mosque, state. specifically, I should say, in your, in your typologies? Uh, it is so. Uh, the same scenario also happens in Malaysia, which uh, the 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 hot uh, the hot air is coming up, uh, is getting above, uh, and the cool air is basically at the ground level. So uh, this is the purpose of design uh, for masjid. Uh, this is the purpose of having a void or a dome in the middle of the prayer hall because uh, the the hot air. Will be will be uh, will be, will be directed to the to the uh, void and there should be any openings or uh, located at the upper level of the building uh, so the the hot air will will uh, exit the building yeah. so basically for vernacular uh, masjid in Malaysia uh, there is a lot <coughs> of openings at the ground level uh, and ceramic ceramic is a uh, is the indigenous nation architecture which means they have the outdoor playing area and uh, the outdoor playing area is usually located at the both side of prayer hall where uh, it it function to to uh, filter the sunlight and then it is the transition area to for the temperature for the air temperature to cool off before people getting in the in the masjid. So I would I would like to share that uh, my, my currently I am doing a, a further research on the function of a ceramic for uh, indoor thermal comfort. Uh, I have not get the 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 full uh, analysis yet, but from uh, cut from the stage that I am right now, uh, ceramic also have certain certain degree of openings and uh, when they when they are within a certain range of openings at the at the ceramic because uh, ceramic also has masharobia masharobia with some uh, carvings or ornamentation and it is ventilated uh, ventilated panel and when they reach a certain ratio certain uh, certain range of opening ratio it may give impact to the to the indoor thermal comfort so it for, for the indigenous Malaysian architecture if the surrounding <coughs> is too much enclosed uh, it will it will impact the uh, heat sensation people will feel that it is hot inside of the prayer hall because the 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 air is not circulating enough uh, inside outside and from what is outside cannot cannot enter enter the the building so uh, I, I am looking forward if I can share yeah. my my further findings in yeah. our next conference. I, I think you're dealing with very severe weather conditions. That's for sure. And mm -hmm. and on top of this, like like the gentleman here has, had asked you, which is humidity. You know, this will reflect on building materials as well, especially indigenous building mm -hmm. material. Uh, wood might get affected with humidity. Um, uh, adobe, like uh, you know, natural. Um, uh, sand or clay that uh, are indigenous also can be affected by by the high uh, humidity. So, um, uh, have you explored more on the materials aspect? Okay. Uh, actually, it is out of my my, my uh, research scope because uh, this is the first the first stage of my my research <coughs> stages where from all of the uh, from all of the aspects in. Uh, vernacular Malaysia architecture uh, I have listed all and um, 
all the all the the elements and this uh, this fills away and uh, questionnaire the purpose is to find the most significant the most significant uh, aspect in Malaysia vernacular architecture. So from here, uh, uh, the conclusion finds that the opening play the the highest, the the, the most significant uh, factor from Malay vernacular architecture, which affect the thermal performance. So unfortunately, the construction and technology part, which is connected with the usage of material. Uh, is not being uh, explored enough uh, in my research. Now we're assuming that there is zero air conditioning in these buildings, correct? Yes, yes. This okay. is a, a natural ventilated uh, yeah. uh, moss. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Siti, and um, we thank you very much for sharing, and we'll go to the next speaker if they're joined. Thank you, Siti. Thank you. So we originally had originally we had four speakers. Um, unfortunately, due maybe to um, techno technology or maybe they have time difference, uh, we apologize for uh, not being able to connect them. And if no questions about this. <laughs> Yeah, I would like to take comments here just to share with us. Uh, normally we have a problem in, in that, or with natural ventilation, that when, the, when there is no wind, when there is no wind, uh, uh, in, in this case the humidity will increase. Uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure how, how is it in, in uh, Malaysia, but uh, in our place there are seasons and parts of the day where the uh, movement of air stops. Uh, normally, we expect the chimney effect to force the, the, uh, the air to move due to, to, to the stack effect. Uh, I thought that in your vernacular architecture, this uh, dome-like that has an opening in the top that will uh, create that effect. Is that true? Okay, uh, yes, it is true that the, the purpose of having a dome uh, masjid is for the air circulation. But uh, it does happen because besides these two uh, masjid, I also have conducted the uh, questionnaire and a uh, field survey at another two other masjid. And uh, at one of the masjid, uh, at one of the building sample, the reading for air velocity is zero over there. So, um, for, uh, for, for my research objective, I have to uh, to reject the hypothesis saying that the passive design uh, building uh, to, uh, it has not given uh, a positive effect to the to the uh, to the mosque, and the it, it should be assisted, and the the, the mosque must be assisted with the me mechanical uh, ventilation to improve the, the thermal condition of the of the buildings because uh, eventually the basic design does not work for, for the building, for the masjid. So there's no in way around part, the mechanics. In this part of the, uh, your part of the world, we see that extensive use of fans instead of mm. air conditioning. Is, is, is this also uh, in uh, traditional uh, vernacular architecture or uh, or they use for... hand fans like what we have. So it's not, it's not okay. mechanical, fan, but fan. Fan. Mm, for For fan, uh, fan is still, uh, for, for vernacular architecture, the usage of fan is still um, accepted and considered as passive design because the fan is circulating the air, the, the existing air inside the, the, the building. Meaning that the, the quality of air inside the building is being circulated using fan but mechanical ventilating um, such as air conditioning uh, is, is not considered as a vernacular it is uh, considered as the 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 existing uh, the exist 
uh, assisting feature to to uh, improve the thermal performance. Thank you. Well, in, in our part of the world, we have, uh, in addition to Mishrabiya, we have the what's so called the wind catchers. And yeah, yes, yes. Uh, if the wind is moving, wind catchers would work. But if the wind is not moving, then it wouldn't help much. And in Persia, they have these elements are so common, and they, when they penetrate these towers of wind, they touch a water body uh, to cool, to passively cool the, these buildings. I don't know what to suggest about Malaysia. It's, it's all humid air, and in some situations, it's zero velocity. How can we deal with that? Okay, um, I am aware that in other parts of uh, the world, they have different elements uh, for passive design, such as the wind tunnel. But uh, for Malaysia, we don't have wind tunnel. It's a chimney. We don't have, we don't use chimney. Maybe, uh, it's the chimney uh, effect, that, that you know, like when the air, hot air goes up, it, yeah, it mm -hmm. makes come some kind of air particular air particle movement with it, and hopefully that's a chimney effect. Is that is that what you're uh, yes. commentating? Uh, we we don't use uh, the uh, the chimney effect uh, because um, maybe it is due to the different different weather condition. Uh, exactly. Uh, comparing to, to Malaysia, because in Malaysia, um, the way of adapting passive uh, design is by making as much opening as uh, possible and shading device. Because uh, due to the rain, uh, due to the rain, uh, so most of the most of the uh, building that apply passive design need the shading uh, needs the extended shading uh, devices so that it will filter the solar radiation and the area which is beneath the shading device will be considered as the transitional area so it will be the 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 transitional between hot and cold uh, the, the inside temperature uh, it is considered the cooling off area. Uh, for mas uh, for house, we have apron around the house, and for masjid, uh, the surrounding, and uh, there is uh, certain terms in, uh, uh, for Malaysia it's called anjung, it's called uh, porch. Yeah, uh, I wish I wish to, to, to see these uh, elements really. Uh, mm. So next time I, I we'll, I show you we'll, we'll plan a trip. We'll plan a trip to Malaysia to to see these elements. Exactly, and you will be our tour guide. <laughs> yes, yes, please. <laughs> because uh, my my research current uh, my my current research is in uh, the uh, the uh, the Malay uh, the masjid architecture in Malaysia and. Uh, Currently, um, I I am conducting a research for 14 buildings uh, in Malaysia. So, inshallah, if uh, if anybody uh, from all of us is coming to Malaysia, I, I am looking forward for for a tour for all of us. We can probably do some joint work and stuff. Uh, Any more questions? Mm. Thank you, City, very much. Uh, sorry for taking so long uh, with you, but uh, it's been My informative. Um, thank you. Thank you, Dave. Hello, Assalamualaikum. Yes, I can hear you. Yes, Doctor. Doctor, Doctor Mohammed, can you hear us? Y yes, sir, I can hear your voice here. Okay. Um, again, I'll take just half a minute to introduce you. Yeah, so your paper is about evaluating effectiveness of, no, that's, that's, that's it, sorry. Um, assessment of energy performance of advanced building thermal insulation in mosque building. Um, you can go right ahead. Uh, yeah, Assalamu alaikum, yeah, my name is Muhammad Abdul Fasi. Uh, I am from, uh, I am actually from India, but I am working in Saudi Arabia in a technology transfer office. So I was an architectural engineering student. I completed my master's thesis in 2013 uh, from King Fahad University of Petroleum and Minerals. Uh, my research topic was analyzing the thermal performance uh, of the windows, the facade designs, uh, focusing on the office buildings. So today I will be presenting uh, a small 
and brief research which I did with my colleague of Sayyid Samyodhi on assessment of energy performance of uh, advanced building thermal insulations in the mosque buildings. Uh, so this chart shows the, the global carbon dioxide emissions over the years uh, in gigaton. So the, the, the emission rates have been increasing gradually as you can see from 2005, 2005 to 2020, but there was a slight dip uh, from 2018 to 19. This was mainly because of the pandemic, COVID-19 pandemic, because most of the most of the most of the people were staying indoors. So that's why the offices were closed, and also the manufacturing many manufacturing plants were closed. So this resulted in the reduction of the global carbon dioxide emission. Uh, this approximate this uh, this was this study was conducted by International Energy Agency uh, in the year 2021. So here this chart shows the 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 most common uh, the most common energy which is being utilized for the production of power. As you can see, uh, major countries most of the countries still use coal as the uh, the the energy source for producing power, followed with renewables. The renewables are being used mostly in the European, in the European uh, Union country, countries, followed with uh, some of North American countries like US and Canada. Still, the usage of the usage of renewable energy is very low in the Arab region. Inshallah, within the future, the usage will increase. And uh, in in the Arab country also, uh, still the power generation relies on the the burning of oil and gas for production of power. A uh, few countries, uh, especially the advanced countries, they use nuclear energy for the production of energy. So here is a categorization of electricity energy which is being used on the building sector in so within Saudi Arabia. So majority, uh, more than half percentage, so 53 percentage of power generation is being utilized in running buildings, residential buildings specifically, followed with the 11 11 percent. Uh, is being used for running commercial buildings, which include the office buildings, and the government buildings uses 12% of the power generation. Uh, the industry uses 18%, and for running agriculture, which is very rare, very scarce here within Saudi Arabia, that's why only 2% of the power generation is used for agriculture activity. Whereas the remaining uh, remaining 4% is used in activities such as uh, running mosques, hospitals, charity organizations, and the street lights which are being used. So here is the picture of how many mosques are there within Saudi Arabia. So in terms of population density, Saudi Arabia contains the highest number of mosques in the world. The number of mosques built by the government has increased significantly, as you can see. Uh, in, in 2018, it was around 55,000. But in 2017, as you can see, it's almost 100,000 mosques which is being made by the Saudi government. Because of the huge number of mosques being built, the Ministry of Islamic Affairs, Dawa and Guidance has issued orders, regulations to specifically training the imams to regulate the mosque electricity energy usage. Uh, so it's, a, it's our moral and religious obligation to save the energy resources so that our offspring can utilize the energy as we are using now. And also, even in the Holy Quran, uh, specifically in the story al Araf, it says clearly that all oh, children of Adam eat and drink, but waste not by excess, for God loves not the wasters. So it's our moral obligation, also religious obligation, not to waste excess energy. So as uh, I think most of you know about the Saudi vision, so in Saudi vision 2030 also, specifically, uh, it describes on the usage of, uh, usage of or implementation of energy conservation measures to reduce the energy consumption in mosques. And it seems the, the Saudi Arabia intends to retrofit more than 90,000 mosques, mosques with solar panels, energy saving measures, and other renewable energy sources. Uh, a, a, a detailed study was conducted by Dr. Adil Abdul, it's from APP. So there, what they did is they did, they did an uh, energy assessment on mosques, which are uninsulated, and try to identify you know, what is the energy consumption by this mosque. And they found that uh, this mosque have the highest energy consumption somewhere around 193 kilowatt hour per meter square per year, which is very high. This, this, uh, these numbers are quite high when compared to the energy consumption in even in office buildings or any other industries, because most of these mass mass which are there in Saudi Arabia were were un, uninsulated. There was no building thermal insulation. 
So what we did is me and me, me and the other co-author, Mr. Say some evening. What we did is so we decided to make a model, so make a model of a mask, uh, and do the energy analysis and try to identify you know which is which is which, which thermal insulation fits the best and what what should be the optimal thermal uh, optimal thickness. Which, uh, which needs to be installed installed in the wall and in the roof of the mosque in order to in order to increase the energy savings in the mosque structures. So mosques are usually characterized by high ceilings with a minimum value of four meter to a maximum value of twelve meters or more. So it varies uh, between four meters to twelve meter. And to accommodate a stu uh, study on mosques that are used both both daily and for Friday prayers here in Saudi Arabia and I think in most of the Arab region. Separate mosques are dedicated for offering Friday prayers and also the special Eid, Eid prayers. So, in order to accommodate the study on mosques that uses both activities, a medium-sized rectangular mosque with conditioned area of 470 square meter was considered, and a capacity of 500 occupants was assumed for this uh, investigation part. The rectangular shape of the mosque has an aspect ratio of approximately 1 is to 1.2, and uh, approximately 250 meters from the east and west axis. So what we did is uh, we created this mosque, this case model mosque, and try to simulate its behavior in three regions of Saudi Arabia, which is Dharan, which, which lies in the eastern province. The climate here is hot and humid. Then we considered the base first model to be located in Riyadh, where the, where the weather is somewhat different. It's hot and dry, not the humid one. Uh, then the Buka region also, which has a very different climate, arid climate, sort of. So here are the characteristics which we considered for the mask. Uh, most of the characteristics for the for, for the parameters which we did not have the value, what we did is we referred to the ASTRA standards and got their values. So as I said earlier, uh, we considered the mask to be located in three regions, the Haran, Riyadh, and Tabu. The floor to ceiling height was considered as 5.5 meters. The infiltration ratio, uh, ratio infiltration 0.5 exchange per hour and the occupancy of 500 people. So uh, we use the, the simulation tool design builder for investigating the energy 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 savings measures uh, within the mosque. So the design builder software. The reason why we selected design builder software because it offers unique features, and it's by using design builder it will be easy to you know design complex buildings models. So this software is somewhat advanced but compared to the other counterpart software. So we decided to select design builder and simulate the results. And the performance of the result was compared with the, an actual mosque, an actual similar mosque which is located in, in the Hoover region, which is in which is in the Iran or you can see Eastern Police. And what we found that the results are from the, the annual energy consumption was almost same. There was a, almost same. There was only an error between 1.5 to 2 percent. So with this, we can validate our model and we can say that the the model which we have prepared in Design Builder, in Design Builder can be used for you know, for the projection or for estimation purpose. So for this study, we uh, for this study we, we selected three thermal insulation, the three most common thermal insulation which have been which is being used globally. The first one is the uh, polyurethane insulation, the second is polystyrene, and the third is the uh, mineral wool insulation. So the third the this is the, the figure you can see how we uh, we place the thermal insulation in the wall panel on, uh, and also the roof panel. So for both, uh, we selected the middle part uh, where the thermal insulation was fitted in the wall panel and also the in the roof panel. So this figure is for the polyurethane insulation and also the location where it was fitted. This is for the mini, the rock, rock pool insulation. The, the good thing about rock pool insulation is it is considered as a green insulation because it is made up of byproducts uh, or the industrial waste. So rock pool insulation comprises of basalt rock, which is basalt rock, which is actually comes from the volcanic rock, and also the recycled slab, which comes from the, which comes from as a byproduct of the steel industry. So this is this is good in fact, uh, and it should be encouraged using the uh, using the green insulated insulation materials for building thermal insulations. And we studied for polystyrene insulation also. So uh, once once making the model and uh, fitting fitting the, these three different insulations, we simulated the result uh, for different thicknesses of the thermal insulations. So the, the top one, the blue one which you are seeing on the top, this shows the 
the energy performance over the period of over the period of year with no insulation, uh, as it is expected because uh, uh, the the summer in Saudi Arabia, summer in Saudi Arabia usually starts from April and it goes till October, which is why the energy consumption by HVAC will be high. So more more energy will be consumed by the HVAC system for running and providing the conditioned air, which is why you can see the peak, especially during the summertime and as we move towards the winter season, the most of the most of the HVAC system within the mosque are closed off and the. the can you please the, uh, speed up, Mohammed? Uh, we don't have. Uh, we have another okay, okay, three minutes, please. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. So, so what, what we did is then we added a thermal insulation with thickness of 10 mm. 20 mm, 30 mm, 40 mm, 50 mm, and 60 mm. So as we increase the thermal insulation thickness, the energy saving value was increased. So and we found that uh, the optimal value which which is reached is between 50 and 60 mm. So we found that even after increasing the thickness after 60 mm, it does not add any advantages. So for a mosque located in the Tehran region with polystyrene thermal insulation, I think 50 to 60 mm of thickness of polystyrene will offer the greatest energy savings. We did see, we did the similar, uh, similar simulation result for rock pool insulation, and for this one also we found that the thermal insulation with thickness of 40 to 50 mm, uh, between 40 to 50 mm offers the highest energy savings. So this is recommended for polyurethane. Also, the similar results were identified. So what we did is we did the similar uh, the the simulations. Uh, for the same, you know, mosque, mosque located in Zahra, mosque located in Riyadh, mosque located in Tabuk region. And what we find it for, for, for all the, for any mosque located in any of these three regions, uh, if they use, poly, if they use uh, this polyurethane thermal insulation, it offers the highest amount of energy savings followed by polystyrene, then rock pool. So it has its advantages. So the conclusion part is, you know, uh, based on the findings from this, proper use of building envelope thermal insulation decreases the energy demand structure and will result in greater energy savings for mosques with a different climatic conditions. And the building envelope, the proper building envelope treatment will be greatly increase the energy efficiency for the mosque, especially. And from this study, the architects or the designer can can come up with what what kind of thickness has to be used in order to come up with good energy savings for the mosque. And also, we did the cost analysis, and we found we, we actually spoke to the suppliers, the, the suppliers of the this thermal insulation, and it seems the cost of the thermal insulation is almost the same, which is 20, uh, which is 20 Saudi real per feet square for it for thermal insulation of 10 mm. So the insulation cost has been uh, calculated, and we feel that the payback period is somewhat low, and this should be encouraged. There are some challenges since this is a, this is a numerical study. So if we have done experimental study, this would have added advantages, but because of the lack of funding, we did the thermal solution, we will get the simulation study, maybe in the future, we have the funds, we can go for the experimental study. And also, there are regulations in Saudi Arabia, for example, the royal degrees has been passed by the Saudi government, uh, making it compulsory for the buildings to use the thermal insulations uh, within office buildings, within so within 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 office buildings and within government buildings. But for mosques, I did not find any regulations from the government. So there should be some government, there should be some regulations from the government in order to be encouraging the mosques okay. who have the thermal insulation in their structures. And also, I believe R&D activities must be supported in the Arab region, encouraging the development of green thermal insulations which produces low carbon footprints. So that's all from my side. If okay. you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Thank you, Mohammed. Um, does anybody have any question? It's quick. Yeah. Well, we'll take one one, one question. question. Okay. We'll take one question because of the buses that are moving. All right. Go ahead. Okay. okay. Uh, uh, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, very nice and uh, <clears throat> quite informative. Um, so as long as we talk, all of us here, as we talk about mosque architecture, so what we you just described uh, can be technically applied to any building, meaning we've got these 500 square meters with roughly, how much was it, like 5 meters, like floor to ceiling height, 5 meters, this, well this is typical commercial building, a medium sized commercial building probably, or smaller. So, um, and ultimately, um, just my comment, I'm sorry, uh, uh, 
when we talk about insulations, when we talk about interior climatizing of the building, this is all done for the visitors, right? Not for the sake of, uh, of, of, of itself. Meaning, um, the, did you somehow uh, study uh, uh, the impact of what you suggest in terms of insulation, in terms of solar heat, or somehow, I mean, yeah, whatever calculations or uh, uh, modeling you did? Uh, I mean, how is that reflected on those who come and pray in, in the mosque? As simple as that. Yeah. So this will directly not benefit the, the the people who are coming for offering the prayers. But I think, yeah, as I said, as a religious duty, uh, it's our responsibility to reduce the energy consumption. And we know there are measures which are, if we can place those measures, this will save energy. So I think this is how it can, it may, it can impact. But it, it will not impact directly to the people who are coming and praying in the mosque. If I can uh, comment on this, I think there are things that can be measured towards uh, an individual, meaning you and I are different and therefore uh, or we go through um, different conditions in life and we may perceive thermal comfort uh, differently. I think Mohammed is focusing on the energy saving part using insulation and types of insulation versus not uh, using any your you found a relationship that's directly proportional when you increase thicknesses of these thermal installations, you um, you kind of save energy um, significantly. Is that correct? So, and, and yes, the commentator, that applies on every building as well. So is there a significant contribution to the field of knowledge that you've added? Uh, is, it, is it related to the location? Is it related to the field of knowledge in general? We pretty much know these uh, these things in a, in a way. <coughs> yeah, this is re related to the location. For example, uh, if anyone is planning to build, a, let's say, if the government decides to build a mosque in Riyadh or in Tehran, they know that if they use this kind of thermal insulation, this will be their benefits and also it's cost effective measure. Okay, so polyurethane is, is the winner on these, uh, correct? What's your reaction on this coating that you know now they're coming up with? With coating that can 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 perform from two aspects. Uh, one is the, the the thermal conductivity. The second would be the UR value reflection uh, of the sun's uh, light. Have you come across uh, other uh, other techniques to to deal with energy saving? Yeah, there are. For example, there are some coatings which can be applied at the exterior part. Uh, so this can be done for the existing mosques as a retrofitting measure, but uh, the, the focus of my research was, you know, for, for the new building, for the new mosque buildings with the, with the, with the government is planning to build on. And for example, there is aerogel also, which is currently under under research, and it has some excellent new characteristics and thermal resistance characteristics. So maybe once the aerogel start moving in the market, then this will offer Huge, huge energy saving measures, not only for mosque structures, for other structures also. Is there any local material that we can think of, like um, oil products, uh, oil byproducts? Well, polyurethane is one of them. Um, in, in fact, in fact, yeah, in fact, at KFPM, uh, we receive a lot of disclosures, innovation disclosures, where the where the you know the professors they test adding some. Uh, rocks from the mountain, and they do perform a very good. Uh, they do perform. They do. They do show very promising results in terms of energy energy performance. But the problem arises, you know, this this material it has to be introduced in the building or Saudi building or let's say, okay. which will be which will be very challenging. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Thank you very much, uh, Mohammed. Uh, we appreciate your contribution. Nicely said. Nicely done. Um, uh, we'll end it up over here because we need to. Move on. Thank you very much.